right, before I get started, I just wanted to take the time to introduce one of our new international guests. This is Dr. Bat Erdin. She's actually from Mongolia, so if everybody could say hi, that would be really nice. All right. All right, guys, so I'll get started with my presentation. The title is, Which Would You Pick? All right, so we'll start out with the case presentation. We had a 38-year-old female. She came, comes in complaining of a blurry spot in the center of her vision in the right eye since the morning. She had poor vision in her left eye for the past 10 years. She, it's due to a chorioretinal scar of unknown etiology. She denied any photopsias, floaters, headaches, or any eye pain associated with this. Her past medical history was significant for diabetes type 2, asthma, high blood pressure, fibromyalgia, depression. She also had a history of valley fever, but no history of autoimmune diseases. The rest of her history was non-contributory. So on exam, her visual acuity with correction was 2050 in the right eye and then 2200 in the left eye. Her pressures were normal. She had an after and pupillary defect in the left eye. And she had this, on confrontational visual field, she had this central scotoma, mainly in her left eye. On slit lamp exam, her external exam was completely unremarkable, as well as her anterior segment exam. Most notably, her anterior chamber had no cellular flare, basically no inflammation in that area. She also had no vitreous inflammation either. However, on dilated fundus exam, she had these yellowish-white lesions uh, in the macula, as well as multiple punched out scars out in the mid-periphery. This was in the right eye. In the left eye, she had some evidence of um, a subretinal fibrosis in the center of her macula, as well as multiple punched out lesions in the mid-periphery as well. On fundus autofluorescence, uh, corresponding to lesions, you see these areas of hypo-autofluorescence and this surrounding halo of hyper-autofluorescence. You can see something similar in the left eye, but a little bit more extensive. On fluorescein angiogram, uh, many of those lesions show, exhibited early hyperfluorescence with late staining and leakage in the right eye. And left eye, um, it was staining due to the subretinal fibrosis and scarring. On OCT, through one of the lesions in the right eye, what you see is this sub-RP accumulation of material, oftentimes extending into the inner retina. This was in the right eye through another, another one of those lesions. And left eye exhibited um, subretinal fibrosis, atrophy, and some cysts overlying that area. So our differential diagnosis at this point include many of the white dot syndromes, such as multifocal choroiditis and panubiitis, PIC, bird shot, like Reese was talking about, uh, diffuse subretinal fibrosis, mutes. You should always think about sarcoidosis as well, um, or an infectious etiology, such so something that's bacterial, fungal, or even viral. Pan serology and imaging testing was done, which came back all negative, including the chest x-ray. At this point, she was given a diagnosis of punctate intercoriodopathy with an associated choroidal neovascular rate membrane in the right eye. She was given an avast injection in the right eye. And we decided to start her on methotrexate with an oral st steroid taper because um, she, was, she had a monocular status. Also, the lesions were very proximate to her fovea, so we instituted INT therapy. So two months later, her visual acuity returned, uh, improved to 20-20 in the right eye, and she had a quiescent exam. Over the next year, she had recurrent activity of the lesion nasal to the fovea, despite continued injections of Osrodex and Avastin, and that's why we escalated care to switching her from methotrexate to Celsept, and she obtained a successful quiescence. In the subsequent year, she had new active lesions in the fovea of the right eye. Therefore, cyclosporin was added, along with continued Avastin and Osrodex injections. So what exactly is punctate intercoriodopathy? It's considered an idiopathic inflammatory disorder, where it was first described by Wosky and colleagues back in 1984. They described 10 patients who were myopic and Caucasian that complained of photopsias, blurred vision, as well as uh, scotomas in the center of their vision. Uh, what they characterized were these small, discrete, yellowish-white lesions at the level of the inner choroid and the RPE, and it was mostly localized to the posterior pole. Most importantly, there was no associated anterior chamber inflammation or any vitreous inflammation as well. 
Now, the who gets pick? Well, a global case series showed that 97% of their patient population who had pick were women, 90% were Caucasian, 85% were, were uh, myopic, and they had a median age of 30 years old, and there's no associated systemic disorders. On presentation, they'll complain of metamorphopsia, a paracentral scotoma, photopsias, and asymmetric loss of central acuity. Fundus findings, as we discussed, there's this yellowish white chorioretinal lesions. They can typically range between the size of 50 to 200 microns. They rarely extend to the mid periphery. And over time, they progress to form these atrophic scars with uh, associated pigmentation. Sometimes you can see serous retinal detachment over confluent active pic lesions. And most importantly, by definition, there's an absence of detritus or AC inflammation, anterior chamber inflammation. On fluorescein angiogram, you typically see early hyperfluorescence of the lesions with late staining. On ICG, you see these in mid-phase hypofluorescence of the lesions, oftentimes more numerous than you would see on clinical exam or even FA. And on OCT, you see the sub-RPE accumulation of material, oftentimes extending into the inner retina. The most vision-threatening complications associated with PIC include choroidal neovascular, choroidal neovascular membrane formation and subretinal fibrosis. And the treatment choices really depends on the clinical presentation. So you would typically observe there are no visual manifestations. You can institute periocular and systemic corticosteroids if there's poor initial visual acuity or the acute pic lesions are very proximate to the fovea, as it was in our case. And IMT, or immunomodulatory therapy, is reserved for persistent or recurrent pic. Anti-VEGF, laser, and PDT, which is photodynamic therapy, is given uh, or administered for uh, choroidal neovascularization that's associated sometimes with this. So at this point in my talk, I want to segue into uh, the discussion section of the two prevailing theories regarding PIC. Some experts believe that PIC and multifocal choroiditis are part of the same disease spectrum. The reason why they think this is, is because there's a lot of overlap in the clinical presentation between these two diseases. Also, there's, there was a genome-wide association study done in the United Kingdom showing that patients with multifocal choroiditis and PIC shared the same haplotype for interleukin-10. Okay. The other uh, prevailing theory is that PIC and multifocal choroiditis and pan are completely separate disease entities, and this is mostly because of the way they've been described historically. Now, what are some of these differences? Well, the main one is that in PIC, the lesions are typically smaller, they're localized mainly to the posterior pole, right, and they very rarely extend out to the mid-periphery. Also in PIC, there's no associated anterior chamber inflammation or vitritis, as I've been hammering. Um, and also, there's no structural complications due to recurrent inflammation as occurs in multifocal choroiditis. And those, some of those include cystoid macular edema, epiretinal membrane formation, as well as cataract formation. Now, it's this recurrent inflammatory chronic nature of multifocal choroiditis that distinguishing these two diseases clinically sometimes is important because studies have shown that early IMT or immunomodulatory therapy for patients with multifocal choroiditis can decrease the risk of complication, complications associated with recurrent inflammation. Actually, one study done by Thorne and colleagues down out at uh, Johns Hopkins showed that um, if you actually institute early IMT therapy in patients with multifocal choroiditis, there's an 83% decreased risk of getting posterior pole complications due to recurrent inflammation. So since the advancement of Im imaging technology, distinguishing these two diseases has become much easier. So on fluorescein angiogram in multifocal choroiditis, the active PIC lesions typically show up in the early phase as hypofluorescent lesions, and in the later phase, they become hyperfluorescent. And PIC, as I already stated before, there's early hyperfluorescence and then late staining or late hyperfluorescence. And then you'll see some leakage as well, as you can see in the center, in the center of the macula there with associated choroidal neovascular membranes. On ICG, you'll see in the mid-phase that the, the lesions typically show a hypo 
fluorescence. Um, oftentimes, it's many, time, many times, it's uh, more numerous than you see on a clinical exam. And that's very similar to what you see in PIC as well, but the lesions are typically smaller, as we said, in PIC. Now, fundus autofluorescence is where things get really interesting because FAF has, has been used to uh, delineate subclinical lesions. So if you see here in panel A, um, there's no, uh, you don't see any lesions along that branch of the, right along this vascular, this branch of the vascular arcade right here. So you don't see lesions there in the red free photograph or on clinical exam. However, on the fundus autofluorescence, you see these hypo-autofluorescent lesions. Three years later, these lesions actually show up okay, on clinical exam as well as on the red free photograph. And the lesions on fundus autofluorescence actually are larger than they were three years ago. And PIC, fundus autofluorescence is also very interesting. What happens is that it's used to mark areas or identify areas that, are un that has uncontrolled inflammation and are prone to reactivation. And they typically show up as this hyper -auto autofluorescent halo. So you see this patient here with an active PIC lesion in panel A, and you have this surrounding hyper autofluorescent halo. However, after instituting cell set, a month later, this hyper autofluorescent halo has actually decreased in size as well as in intensity. Contrast that to the two panels below where you see a patient with persistent PIC, and what you see is this hyper autofluorescent halo, right? Um, and this patient didn't respond to therapy, and over time, that hyper autofluorescent halo has actually increased in size and intensity, as well as consistent with the progression of the disease, as you can see in the area of the hypo autofluorescent lesion. On OCT, multifocal choroiditis, you can see the lesions that typically have a disruption of the IS, OS, or outer retinal layers. Also, you, they can exhibit this sub RP accumulation of material, overlying vitreous, uh, indicated by the blue arrows there, and this hyper reflective band in the choroidal layer. On PIC, inactive lesions show su a sub-RP accumulation of material as well, as well as loss of the ISOS or outer retinal layers. OCT can also be used to track uh, response to treatment. Here in, in the above image in panel C, you see the sub-RP accumulation of material. After prompt treatment and good response to treatment, you actually see that that area has actually decreased in size. So what are the take-home points? First one, imaging utility. Multimodal imaging can help distinguish between these two disease entities. And this is really important because you want to identify multifocal choroiditis because instituting early immunomodulatory therapy can help prevent a lot of the posterior pole complications that are associated with this chronic recurrent nature of this disease. Some other takeaway take points. PICS should always be considered and all the white dot syndromes and differential diagnosis. Choroidal neovascularization and subretinal fibrosis are the most vision-threatening complications of PIC. And INT or immunomodulatory therapy should be instituted. You should consider this in patients with PIC that's persistent and recurrent, as was in our case. And lastly, but not least, PIC and multifocal choroiditis should be considered, may be considered as part of the same disease, but further studies need to be completed in order to test this hypothesis. On that note, I'd like to thank Dr. Vitali for giving me the opportunity to present this case as I've learned a lot from this. Thank you. That would, be, that would imply that there'd be one new case a year in Utah. Yeah, so that, there is a bias for that in the earlier studies um, because a lot of times these, these uh, diagnoses have been um, uh, diagnosed improperly as posed, you know, presumed ocular histoplasmosis syndrome or even, um, you know, other white dot syndromes. So when they finally get to the uveitis center, it's possible that a lot of the other ones that have been misdiagnosed haven't actually been diagnosed as PICs. So it was a study that was done like in the 80s or so. 
I think that's yeah, yeah, it's definitely it's, wrong. It's much more common. It's much yeah, more yeah, that would be an incredibly rare disease. You know, uh, it's 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 actually a very interesting disease. I think that part of the uh, kind of controversy in terms of you know, are they the same disease or not and stuff, it has to do with uh, who's seeing them and who's reporting them. So. I mean, uh, multivocal cordiasis comes to UBI as people, so more advanced diseases with inflammation, whereas I think in a retina practice, you might be more apt to see PIC. Um, on the, uh, so I think that you know, people are thinking, well, you know, you, we are seeing different things. And patients with multivocal cordiasis, as Renee pointed out, you know, present with um, much more, many more structural complications than patients with PIC. So cataract, every retinal membrane, macular edema, as opposed to PIC, the most common presentation is with um, coronary vascular membrane, really, and uh, decreased vision. Uh, uh, you might pick up multivocal corditis, you know, in a patient that has macular edema or inflammation in the eye. And the in, the importance of this and why I put these two together, uh, you, we're starting out with Bircha that really requires systemic therapy pretty soon after the onset. With multivocal corditis and pancreas and PIC, you might, if a patient came in with characteristic lesions of PIC, they're inactive, there's no inflammation, you might observe that patient, okay, and warn them about any metamorphopsia. Patient with multifocal cordis and pancreatitis, you might treat them uh, with uh, periocular steroids, uh, but you have a lower threshold to treat them with uh, immunomodulatory therapy. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that I think that uh, the distinction in terms of treating the patient it sometimes it's artificial because if we had a patient, this patient with PIC had really advanced disease, they're already behind the curve with a very poor outcome in one eye, okay, and in the fellow eye they've got a lesion that's threatening their phobia. So we were presuming that this entity is an, an inflammatory uh, cause and that placing the patient on an anti-inflammatory uh, you know, course in addition to treating a cordial vascular membrane seems to make sense. You know, historically patients, uh, People were treated with periodic steroids for inflammatory cortical vascular membranes. And the membranes, Paul, as you know, are different in PEC you know, than they are in AMD. So these are type two type of membranes that are usually above the, uh, um, the retinal pigment epithelium, are more classic in nature, and uh, respond pretty well to anti uh, VEGF therapy. Okay, so. Thank you. Uh,